Greetings from Las Vegas and welcome to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with you on a Friday night. Glad to be here representing EOG. The three letters stand for Ion Gaming. EOG.com, a website dedicated to the hearts and minds of sports bettors everywhere. Plenty of EOG contributors in town taking in the handicapping seminar at uh, the former Las Vegas Hilton and the LVH, now the Westgate Hotel and Casino. I learned something interesting tonight. Still the uh, LVH Casino. They can't make the name change until the casino chips transferred over to the Westgate name. The chips in the casino still have the LVH logo, and so they'll have to go with the LVH Casino for now until gaming approves the switch and uh, they'll have Westgate chips then, and everything's Westgate. So it's the LVH Casino, the Westgate Resort. Joining us tonight on the program, Eric Stresser. He had a busy day at uh, Westgate uh, Resort. Uh, he was there um, about 8 o'clock this morning, taking in a lot of the action, taking in some um, proxy action in the uh, Super Contest. He's uh, helping out plenty of EOG contributors and others around the country. Eric Strasser, good evening and welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, John. Nice to be here. And it was a fun day. We, we got to meet a lot of good people today. We did. Woodrow Wilson, an EOG contributor, and Red Eye, who's best known for his contributions at the RX. They were both in town. They joined us for breakfast with Steve McLaughlin, Freddie Keck, our friend Jim Jacobs. It was a fun hour and a half at the Orleans Hotel and Casino. We took in the breakfast uh, this morning. Tomorrow I have a breakfast date at South Point with my good friend Looker. We're going to talk about the future of EOG. A lot happening at that website over the next week and a half or so. Uh, but about our breakfast this morning, Eric, very funny line. Um, Eric Strasser said to Jim Jacobs this morning, how does it feel this week to be a Red Sox fan? Uh, to which Jim Jacobs replied, it's football season, Eric. <laughs> it's football season. Yeah, it's uh, my, my, my sports getting... Uh getting the short end of the, of the stick from now on until the end of the year. And I, I get that. Everybody loves football. And, uh, I mean, the, the LVH was just bombarded today. A lot of people for the seminar. It was very well attended. A lot of good information. But the one thing from you have to confirm um, for the great Steve McLaughlin, who gave me a little bit of, well, we'll call it aggravation today, I did get a haircut today. I found an arrow to squeeze it in. So, Stevie, I'm all good. <laughs> Talk about a busy day for Eric. Mm. Uh, man about town, to be sure. And he's with me tonight in the 10 o'clock hour to talk baseball. We'll ask him for his top plays from the Saturday card. We'll also talk, more importantly, about uh, who's hot and who's not in Major League Baseball. The teams uh, that are ascending and those that are descending. We were at the handicapping seminar tonight, the uh, Westgate Resort and uh, the first panel was talking college football. I thought they did an excellent job. Uh, Dave Koken, uh, Kenny White, Bruce Marshall, and Brian Edwards. Those were the four on the panel. Mitch Moss served as the moderator. Uh, uh, Brian Blessing was the master of ceremonies. And what a well-run uh, promotion that is! Not just in the super contest with the uh, number of entrants gaining every year, but also that handicapping seminar, the golf tournament that goes tomorrow. They've really marketed it beautifully. And I've got some notes from that college handicapping seminar that I'll relay to our listeners uh, tomorrow in the Monday blog. Uh, uh, so I've got a few notes now for our listeners, but readers of EOG will uh, read some more notes uh, from Koken and White Marshall and Edwards. So it, it should be a, an interesting blog entry tomorrow. Eric, you took in that seminar as well. What were your thoughts? Oh, I thought it was terrific. I mean, great information from all of the panelists. And also it was nice because a couple of future plays that I've already made, I got a little bit of confirmation on uh, from the panelists, which was very nice to see. Uh, it was it was just a lot of good information. I mean, these guys know their stuff, and um, they weren't shy about sharing, which is also very nice. There was a lot of information, a couple of plays thrown out, but... Um, yeah, it was, it was, there's nobody that could have attended that didn't say they didn't get something out of it, which is great. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be around. I, I, I really wanted to stay for the last panel. Um, a couple of my friends up on the, up on the dais and I wanted to hear it, but if I didn't go home and at least spend a little bit of time preparing for this show tonight, I would have embarrassed myself even more than, you know, I sometimes do, but I had to get home and get some work done and, uh, I got a little bit done, so we have a lot of stuff to talk about, but, you know, I didn't get through every game, so I'm not uh, not 100% as prepared as I'd like to be. I've heard word that we can hear that handicapping seminar early next week. If you go to the website, 
thelvh.com slash super contest. We're going to have a link there. So if you missed that handicapping seminar and want to hear what the guys had to say in full, thelvh.com slash super contest, and you can go over uh, some of what they said. Uh, Bruce Marshall, I have always liked him in terms of his historical perspective, relating it to what's happening today. Uh, he said one of his strongest bets of the year is going to be Mississippi State <laughs> over the total of seven and a half wins. He yeah. really liked that play. Uh, Dave Koken said about the Mountain West Conference, go with Wyoming, go against San Diego State. That's the kind of information I like to hear early in a season, Eric. You know, the, the go on team and, and the go against team. Yeah, that's great information. And what Dave said that I thought was really great information was he says, you might not see it with Wyoming on the field in terms of wins and losses, but you will see it in terms of the point spread. He says they're improved. The coach is terrific. They're going to be much more competitive than they were, were and that people expect them to be. And it will show up probably. Uh, well, it will show up on the field, but it will show up uh, more in the point spread because they're not as well thought of as some of the other teams. And uh, he thinks it's uh, it's a team that's going to fly a little bit under the radar just for a little bit. But he says you, you'll you'll catch some a lot, some value or a lot of value with Wyoming early. And as you said, that's great great information. And as for Brian Edwards and Kenny White, they had contributions uh, to the seminar as well. Edwards, known as an SEC expert, he came with this nugget. Three of the 14 teams in the SEC uh, started eight games or more last season. So they had a lot of replacing to do in terms of the quarterback position in the SEC. For that reason, uh, some people think the SEC will be down, but being down at the top of the heap uh, might not put them in second place. Brian says the SEC is still the best conference going. The Pac-12 closing fast, but the SEC still should be ranked number one. Kenny White disagreed. He says, no, it's the Pac-12 over the SEC. And Kenny was big on these Pac-12 teams. Very. He talked about the defenses in the Pac-12, that they're going to be much improved. He said, controversially, that Washington may have the best front seven in college football. Yeah, I looked around the room and saw a couple of jaws drop when he said that. That's uh, that's quite a statement, and we'll, I guess we'll see how it plays out. But... Um, it's really interesting to listen to Kenny because he's talking about the differences and the improvements on the defensive side of the ball almost across the conference. And obviously, when you get those two middle-of-the-road Pac-12 teams, like a Washington and Arizona and Arizona State, you know maybe you don't get to 63 or 61 or whatever the game's going to be lined at. So it's going to be – I'm probably just going to take a wait-and-see attitude – first week or so, but, uh, you know, it's, if you see the defenses, I mean, that, the great part about that is now you have something specific to look for, mm. and if you see it, um, and you're not going to see it on Direct TV, of course, because they don't have the Pac-12 network, but if you do see it, then it's something you can jump in on, and after one game, all the value won't be gone, but you'll be able to um, look for something specific, confirm it with your own eyes, and then jump in and hopefully cash some tickets. And the beauty of listening to other handicappers talk, you can accept or reject their theories. Sometimes, Eric, when I hear a handicapper, I, I, I learn through instructive error. Sometimes I say, oh, no, he's making a mistake here. That, that, and that's why others are following, because they're thinking the same thing, but when in fact uh, something else is true. Uh, um, although with Brian Edwards, he's, he's such uh, an SEC researcher that a lot of his opinions are strong. He even had a strong opinion on my favorite team in the Big Ten this season, Michigan State. He says mm-hmm. MSU will go 11-1 and uh, this year uh, before they play uh, the Big Ten championship game likely and on to the uh, Final Four possibly. But uh, over 9.5 is their regular season win total, and Brian has them scheduled to win 11 games this season. They're 25-1 to to win the national title. He even thought that that was worth a flyer as well. And that's interesting information because the Braxton Miller injury for Ohio State, you know, what happens a lot of times with these sports books, they'll get a piece of information and not be able to go all the way. So they'll get information on Braxton Miller being out, so they'll quickly reduce Ohio State from a 17.5 point favorite maybe to a 12.5 point favorite over Navy, which we saw recently at Caesars Palace. They'll adjust the win total for Ohio State but then they won't take that next step and adjust the win totals of other Big Ten teams. Uh, well, you made a great point this morning at breakfast when you said that it may not affect the win total as much as people think because they were going to be a 17-point favorite. They're still going to be a 12-point favorite, which means most likely they're still going to win the game. And in most of the games that they're going to play, I mean, right now they're 
you know, a pick em or a couple of points with Michigan State either way. But in most of their games, uh, there's obviously the win percentage, the win expectation drops when you go from 17 to 12 or from 19 to 13 or whatever that is. But you're still more than likely going to win the game. You're still a very large favorite to win the game. So therefore, you know, the drop in the season win total, um, you can make a case that is not the right way uh, it should be, or not the right way the book should handle this. It's very possible the market could overreact to the Miller injury, bet that Ohio State under too much, and then create value for the overs. JT Barrett will be the uh, backup for... uh, Braxton Miller, he'll come in now and be the starting quarterback, redshirt freshman. He began camp as a third stringer. How do I know that? I learned that from Bruce Marshall tonight. So you, right. you know, you've got to be willing to set the ego aside, learn from everyone, listen to everyone, follow no one, make your own judgments when you eventually step to the window, but make sure, you know, the ears are open. I mean, you don't want, you know, and you've got to be careful. Uh, you know, you want quality sources. You know, the, well, these guys course. tonight, Koken, White. Edwards, Marshall, they've been around. I sure. mean, they're not going to say anything silly. Uh, you want to avoid the super silly nonsense. Uh, but uh, for the most part, guys who are in the market and, uh, and you know, and trying to gamble and win at this and making handicapping a profession, you know, they, they pretty much do their homework. They absolutely do their homework. And they, actually, one of the last things in the first panel tonight, something that we've talked about on this show a couple of times, and I, and I think it is one of the truest statements, and the statement was, if you don't pay attention to Twitter, you don't know what you're doing because there is so much good information on Twitter. It's just incredible because coaches and beat writers and even backup quarterbacks and it just they were just all kinds of people and they just go and they they're not talking about things in a gambling perspective. They're just talking about things. You know, well, we couldn't make a tackle today. I mean, you know, that mm-hmm. type of stuff is out there almost every single day. Great, and, great injury information. Great injury <laughs> on Twitter. I I was telling one of our one of our friends that you mentioned earlier today the story. The and I think I've even mentioned on the show here the, the Monday before the British Open, Ian Poulter, who is on Twitter all the time, comes out and says, "Oh, my wrist is killing me. I got to go for an MRI." And I saw that, and I said, are you kidding me? And, I mean, I bet uh, the other side of a matchup for a couple of units against him, and the guy that I bet, who I got, I think it was plus 110 with, closed about a 150 favorite in the matchup, which is, you know, that inf- and it's just right there. All you've got to do is turn on the computer and look for it, and you've got guys telling you things that are just, you know, they're not thinking, oh, guys are going to use that to go out and bet against me. He's just thinking, you know, I'm really, it's the British Open, and I'm, my, my wrist hurts, and then doesn't this stink? But yeah, there's ways to interpret, and there's 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 money to be made just by uh, just by using the resources that are all of our disposal. I love to watch a baseball game with the Twitter feed going from the beat writers <laughs> of the respective teams. Yeah. I mean, it really does color in what you don't know, especially if the sound's not up. If if you don't have access to the sound on every game, uh, say you're in a sports book. And, uh, you know, you, you don't have one of those monitors where you can switch in, uh, the, the spots and see the, uh, and hear the different uh, feeds. But You mean like a guy who hangs out in sports books pretty much all day, every day? Is that that type of guy? <laughs> that would be that guy, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Twitter feeds pr- provide so much information, so much insight, and, uh, and information you can't get anywhere else. Th- those beat writers are good. No, they are. And the, the stuff comes, it comes at you. And there are different ways. Um, some beat writers will tweet every time a guy gets a hit or knocks on a run. or You know, they always, I think, just assume you're not watching the game. But then there's guys like John Fay, who's a beat writer for the Cincinnati Reds, who really is well-connected. And um, uh, he knows what the brass is thinking. He knows what the players are thinking. And he's not sarcastic. And he doesn't really make fun of the team or the organization, especially as bad as they've been recently. But you do get a lot of good information from guys like that. It, you know, it's just there for you. you. All you have to do is go out and get it. But again, we've talked about this before, too. It's all the effort. I mean, it's uh, the money goes to the guys who work the hardest. And when you are reading... Twitter, and you, you, it's almost like you can't get away from it because you don't know what you're going to miss. So you have to monitor it pretty much throughout the day. But, you know, those guys that do that and those guys that, that work the hardest, they get the money. Good night then tonight at uh, the old LVH, now the Westgate, to the Westgate Resort. I saw Arnie K. Lang there. He's going to come on a future uh, program. I didn't get a chance to talk to, talk to Arnie, but it's, it's, oh, 
I wish he was on a college football panel because, boy, there's nobody better. Yeah, I love Arnie. You and Ar- oh, boy, I'm telling you, like, there's nobody better. You used to do the show with him. I mean, probably the premier sports gambling show of the last 50 years. I know all about Lee Pete, but the Sunday Night Stardust show with you and Dave and Arnie and – Oh boy, was that that was the best. That was just I, mean, I used to stay up. I was living in Atlanta on the time. I was doing some consulting down there and I was uh and I used to stay up and uh, and listen to uh, I was just I I I have so many friends that we still talk about that, you know, from years and years ago. God, were you guys great. It was that was the best sports gambling radio ever. Oh, uh, kind words to be sure. Arnie K. Lang had a partner early on, uh, Roxy Roxborough, you know, when Roxy was the man who was setting the numbers in Las Vegas. This yeah. is pre offshore. Uh, and, uh, you know, Roxy was the complete authority. I always liked it because Arnie was the journalist, Roxy was the odds maker, and they'd go back and forth. And when Dave Malinsky joined the Stardust mm-hmm. Line, you know, it took it to another level <laughs> in terms of handicapping yeah, genius. Arnie, I, actually, I meant Dave Malinsky and not, not the other Dave, but yeah, that was that was terrific stuff. And I wasn't here at the time, as I said. So, uh, but even back on the East Coast, and I know people all over the country that we just used to stay up, listen to it, and then talk about it the next morning. But uh, yeah, it's that's a tough way to go to work on a Monday morning after staying up till God knows when to listen to you guys. But you know, it wasn't it wasn't like it is now where there's podcasts and everything's available. 15 minutes after the show, you know, and you can listen. It wasn't like that. So you stayed up or you listened or you missed it. And uh, we chose, all of us, we chose to stay up and listen. Great stuff. Uh, boy, you guys should do, you should rest the Resac show, John. That would be, that would be fantastic. If Monday night edition in the EOG Sports Hour, you, Dave, and Arnie putting, uh, putting together an hour of, on college football. I Arnie's a free agent. I think Dave Malinsky's teamed up now with uh, pregame.com. So I think his time, I yeah. think on Mondays, I think he's featured on the pregame radio show. I got a chance to ch- uh, chat with RJ Bell uh, today. He said we're going to grab lunch uh, in the near future. He's not very happy, I think, with what's going on at EOG. He's disappointed in, in uh, the community and uh, the shots that are taken there. But uh, kind of comes with the territory in an open yeah. forum. It's the wild, wild west and sometimes hard to control. It's funny, you know. Pre-game has strict controls. Ion Gaming, almost no controls. So there, there's got to be so, you know, a happy medium there somewhere. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a different business, though. And um, and Dave Malinsky, I know he's going to be doing a lot of uh, visual content there, um, as he used to do um, for covers. And uh, Dave is uh, there's nobody that handicaps and gets inside a game like Dave Malinsky. He is the best. He can tell a tale. You know, that's uh, that's the thing about Dave. He really he really gets background information that no, pretty much nobody else has and then uh, and then tells the tale of the game and uh we'll see if it wins or loses. Long term I would have to think he's he wins more than he loses. Well, I don't know all of his numbers, and I'm certainly not in any position to know or to care because it's not my business, but I can tell you this. If you spend enough time listening to Dave, he will change the way you think about a wager. He will change the way you think about looking at a game. And uh, he, he wrote a series of articles for covers earlier this baseball season. He was writing one every Monday and one every Friday, and it would basically just be points from the weekend or from during the week. And there were such great thoughts in there. I, 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 he's not doing it anymore, and it's a shame because the content was magnificent. And it was for guys like me. Um, I love to read stuff like that, and I'm really sorry I don't get to do it anymore. Had a chance tonight to visit with Eric Austin. Paulie Mack was there. CB Spencer was at our table. Easy goer from EOG. Yep. Uh, he was there as well. So a lot of fun, well, plenty of camaraderie. Bobby the Owl uh, was um, there as well. I saw him at a distant table. He's mm-hmm. going to be on the program next week to preview the upcoming college football season. So great event for the handicapping community here in town, um, that handicapping seminar. It's run by Jay Cornegay and the boys. Let's step aside and take a quick time out right here. When we return, um, we'll handicap baseball action. Uh, <laughs> we'll ask Eric for a play for tomorrow. But more importantly, we'll take a look at the teams uh, that are on the up escalator and those on the down escalator. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. There's no such thing as a sure thing, unless you're talking about Ion Gaming. Ion Gaming is a website dedicated to the hearts and minds of sports bettors everywhere. 
If you're looking for smart, sophisticated sports handicapping information and insight, go to EOG.com. If you're looking for the latest news on the ever-changing landscape of Nevada's race and sportsbook industry, go to EOG.com. If you're looking for the most recent developments involving the worldwide sports betting scene with an emphasis on the leading sports books in San Jose, Costa Rica, go to EOG.com. And finally, if you're looking to join an online community of sports gamblers where registration is free and the information is priceless, go to EOG. You get the idea. Why gamble on other sports betting websites when Eye on Gaming is a sure thing? And I love a sure thing. Hi, this is Rick Alec, president of Sports Options. Sports Options is a sports information tool designed to give sports bettors of all types the necessary edge needed to improve their bottom line. With Sports Options, you'll never lay a bad number again. We provide you with live odds from the leading sports books in the world, from Costa Rica to Curacao, London to Las Vegas, and everywhere in between. Sports Options also provides the fastest and most accurate injury information, lightning quick score updates, and game analysis from 30-year handicapping veteran Mark Simons. We offer affordable services for players of all levels, starting at just $99 per month. To see which service best fits your needs, you can take advantage of our 7-day free trial. No credit card is needed. Just go to www.sportsoptions.com and click on the free trial link. I'm confident you'll be impressed with our product and you'll find it the most complete and comprehensive on the market. In fact, if you don't like sports options after 30 days, we'll refund you 100% of your subscription costs, no questions asked. Go to sportsoptions.com for all the details or call 702-835-1743 and one of our friendly customer service representatives will be happy to help you. Sports Options, information you can bet on. And we are back. The EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with you on a Friday night alongside Eric Strasser, a.k.a. Palm Tree. His website, palmtreehandicapping.com. Want to say hello tonight to Hustle Double, who started a thread title tonight at EOG. Appreciate his help with the forum. Also, Sports Are My Life. He's in town. I hope to track him down sometime tomorrow. I mentioned the handicappers. I omitted uh, Ted Sobranski's name. I saw Fezzik. Aaron Renning. Dave Tooley was part of a handicapping panel as well. So, again, outstanding Dave event. Tooley, I love Dave Tooley's NFL analysis. He's an underdog-only player. I mean, if, if, if he loves the favorite, he just passes the game, which I think um, I question that a little bit. But, boy, do I love his opinion. He is so underrated as a handicapper. Here, here, And what I like about Dave Tooley is on a Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific, he is committed to watching mm-hmm. the games and – he, take no, he takes uh, uh, notes, uh, fastidious, I was going to use the word fastidious notes. Uh, he, <laughs> he, he, is a, he is a journalist. It's an SAT word, John. <laughs> <laughs> he, knows, he knows what he's looking at, too. And if you do this long enough, you almost have to know, you know what, what happened. I mean, you really build up a good gambling intuition. I think that's what Thule has. Dog only, I agree with you. When you only see one side of the card, I think it's dangerous because you're missing some of the best plays out there. I often think, Eric, that the best play you can make is the focused favorite. There's nothing quite like a... I mean, I love live underdogs, but the dead nuts play to me hmm. is the focused favorite. <laughs> someone uh, someone called Pete Carroll, I guess. His, his team is ridiculous. I mean, it's preseason now. They're Super Bowl champions, and they're running people out of the building. I mean, they just annihilated the Bears tonight. And it's, talk about a team that... This is a team that may not live up to that old axiom of fade the Super Bowl champion in the first couple of weeks of the season. Carroll seems to have that team, and he has had that team for a few years now, just focused on just about every week. I don't remember a week where they came out and laid an egg. They just don't do it. And you got to give him credit. And this is a guy, the Patriots couldn't stand him. They got rid of him. The Jets couldn't stand him. They got rid of him. He goes to USC. They break every rule in the book, but they win a national championship. He goes to Seattle now, and, I mean, he's building a dynasty. And it's like a college atmosphere, too, on the sidelines. I'm sure in the locker room as well. They're having fun while winning. One angle I like to look at, I love professional teams that have a college approach, a kind of a rah-rah feel to them. And I like college teams with a professional approach. I like the college football and college basketball teams that take things 
very seriously. I like the pro teams that have fun on the sidelines and have tremendous camaraderie through the ranks, and that's one thing Seattle does have. Ed the Statman, our Wednesday night guest, took it on the chin tonight. He had Chicago plus seven. One of the main reasons he played the game, he had a trend. Preseason underdogs of seven points or more are 67 and 44 since 1983. We can now make that 67 <laughs> and 45. Well, I'm not going to criticize that. I think Ed does a terrific job. Uh, but he was just on the wrong side of it tonight. I mean, Carroll and his team, they don't let up. And uh, again tonight, they came out in a game that meant absolutely nothing to them. And it's the season that they're obviously ready to start. And they just, you know, they just laid it on them. So uh, we learned more about Seattle. And, uh, you know, you're not going to see um, teams. Uh, you're not going to see Seattle there. I mean, People will not be afraid to bet them as a favorite in the preseason anymore. Next year, when they open seven on a game, you can look for the line to keep moving higher as opposed to uh, it did move a little higher. I think it went to seven and a half today. But, you know, there's a lot of people that will not lay seven points in a preseason game, which I understand. But, you know, Seattle doesn't fit that mold. Ed took a bad loss there. I took a tough loss tonight. John, the worst beat I've seen all year. The Major League Baseball, Fenway Park. Under the total of seven. Number went up to seven and a half. I grabbed it early at seven. Money came for the total over. Amazingly, the That's total. That's the Joe Kelly factor. Got there. Yeah, Kelly's. Uh, Felix Hernandez, you knew, was going to be rock solid. But actually, it was Kelly who pitched well. Pitched uh, a little better than King Felix, in fact. And he sure uh, did. What happens? Uh, Boston leads 3 nothing. heading into the top of the ninth inning. Seattle down to its last strike. And would you believe the Mariners? Scored five runs. Three nothing, man on first, two outs and two strikes, and they scored five runs. I, I mean, that's as bad a beat as you can possibly have. It's just awful. And Yuihara, right? Uh, yeah. How does that happen? Yeah, he hasn't been the same this year. I mean, he's right now, it's number one, relief pitchers, you know, notorious for over the course of time, everybody regressing back to the mean. Uh, everybody except Mariano Rivera, that is. Uh, but, I mean, I, it's got to be so tough for a guy like that. And for the entire team, I mean, these are proud veterans. Dustin Pedroia, David Ortiz, these guys that have won multiple championships, and now they're just playing out the string. Um, it's really got to be tough for the team like that to be focused. Uh, we're going to get to them a little bit later when we talk about teams um, that you definitely want to be avoiding at this point. And the Red Sox have to be on that list. It's, uh, there's a, you can't make that list in baseball these days without having the Red Sox near the top. Red Sox lost six straight games now, and the wheels are off, obviously. Uh, how about the Seattle Mariners? 69-58, they're still scrambling for a, a postseason berth. Yeah, and tonight they jumped the Tigers back into the second wild card spot. And the Mariners are one of those teams that if they make it to the playoffs, they are going to be a giant pain in the butt for somebody because they do the three things that you have to do to win in the playoffs. They have a great bullpen, they catch the baseball, and their starting pitching is as good, if not better, than anybody else's. Um, it's going to be very, very hard to match up with King Felix, um, Iwakuma, and they almost have a choice as who they're going to use as the third starter. It's it's not even definite who they're going to use. But you know, you've, you're going to win a five game series against the Mariners. You're probably going to have to beat either King Felix or Iwakuma a total of twice. That's not going to be easy. So you know, their their starting pitching is uh, they may be the second wild card team. But <coughs> excuse me. They may be favored in just about any series they play. Here's so. what I've learned about postseason baseball through the years, Eric. You mentioned, you know, it's about pitching, starting <laughs> pitching, and the bullpen, and then it's about catching the ball. Defense is critical. Hitting, it's interesting in the postseason. It's not about hitting, it's about timely hitting. It's yeah. when you hit. And you, you just got basically the goal in the postseason is to scratch, build a couple of runs. Small ball, you know, get King Felix two or three runs and then see what happens. And the Mariners are very equipped to do that. So yeah, they're, they're going to be a real pain in the neck for somebody if they make it. And if they're competing with the Tigers right now for the second wild card, and I know that the Blue Jays and the Yankees and the Indians are, you know, they're all on the fringe of the race, but let's forget about them for a minute. The problem Mariners have in getting to the playoffs is their division is so strong. They have multiple games left with the A's and the Angels who are now going at it against each other to try and stay out of that wild card game. 
And the A's won uh, first blood, or they got drew first blood tonight when they they beat the Angels. The Angels made it interesting in the ninth inning, but um, Chris Sinead has struck out with the bases loaded, and the A's won the game 5-3. But the Angels have one job this weekend. It would be great to win the series uh, and expand the lead, but they all they have to do this weekend is not get swept. If they win one game this weekend, they leave – Oakland with the lead in the division. Now they come home. They're going to play some home games. I'm not sure what they're going to do about Garrett Richards. Uh, that's a really, really big problem for them because the one area that they're not deep at all is starting pitching. And if they think Wade LeBlanc is going to get them you know, to the division title, well, I, I have to see it to believe it. So. What a job by Matt Shoemaker the night after Garrett Richards goes down. He's a rookie. He has 12 wins already this He's season. He's got 12 wins. Quality uh, quality season for Matt Shoemaker. Nobody was expecting that. And that's actually one of the things uh, in my notes for tonight. Um, the Major League lead is 15 wins. There's nobody that's won more than 15 games. Uh, there's four guys that have done that. Kershaw, um, and one are gonna t- we're going to talk about one of them, Willie Peralta, who pitches tomorrow for the Brewers. Uh, and, you know, Matt Shoemaker's got 12. And... Uh, so I don't know how many starts you have, but it's not nearly as many as some of these other guys. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with Eric Strasser talking Major League Baseball. We'll go on record with selections uh, near the end of the program. We've talked a lot of American League Baseball. What's happening in the National League? The Washington Nationals tonight had their 10-game winning streak snapped, a 10-3 loss to the San Francisco Giants. Yeah, uh, they, uh, they had a bad night, but they've won 10 games in a row. It wasn't going to go on forever. Uh, believe me, nobody in Washington is concerned. But we talked last week, John. I said, sat right here in this chair and told you I don't trust the bullpen. And even though they won a bunch of games this week, a lot of them were walk-offs where the bullpen gave up the lead late in the late innings, and then they had to win it um, almost like a come-from-ahead win, you know, <laughs> because they, they were leading, they yeah. get to the late innings, the bullpen blows the game, and then the offense has to bail them out and score a run late. Uh, you but, have to win the game twice. You have to win. Well, yes, but also you got to give the bullpen credit for after blowing the game, then holding it where it was, so giving the offense a chance to score a run, whether it was a, a one or two or three innings down the line. And um, you know the Diamondbacks, uh, they went in there and they lost four games, three of them by one run, and the last one was on an error in a game where the Nationals didn't get a hit with a runner in scoring position. They had 16 base runners, and then they won a game in the bottom. I think it was the bottom of the 10th, maybe the 11th. It doesn't really matter. On an error, because they didn't get one of those 16 base runners across the plate uh, before um, the uh, Diamondbacks threw the ball away. And, you know, that's... Timely hitting, as you said, you can't win championships that way. But and the ability to move runners over, I think that's becoming a. I, I think what with the steroid era and guys swinging for the fences, we're now getting back to the fundamentals, where fundamentals are critically important in a game where we're seeing decreased scoring. I mean, this year, um, fewer runs scored this year than any time in the past 22 years. We're seeing a lot of 2-1-3-2 baseball. Absolutely. But you know what's really different about this era than the 22-year ago era? Sabermetrics now. We know a lot more than we used to know. And one of the things, and I've got to give credit to Dave Koken on this because he rails about this on his show all the time here in Las Vegas, is the bunt. And the sacrifice bunt and giving away an out in bad spots. Mm. And the Marlins aren't going to be a playoff team. But about a week ago, I was watching a Marlin game, and it was tied in the late innings. And Kristen Yelich gets on base. He's the leadoff hitter. He gets on. And the Marlins bunt with Donovan Solano. Bunt Yelich to second, and now Mike St- or Giancarlo Stanton is up. You've taken the bat out of his hand. There's not a chance in a million then any manager is going to let Stanton beat them. So now you've taken Stanton's butt out of the inning. It's, I mean, it is such a bad play. My, uh, to me, the worst play in baseball, and every National League manager does it, is first and third with one out and the pitcher up, and they bunt. And now you've got second and third, and you've got a leadoff hitter up, you know, maybe with a 330, 340 on base percentage, and you've basically taken your ability to score down to – a little better than one and three because you do have the wild pitch and the error and the pass ball. But it's insanity. I mean, if the guy hits into a double play, so be it. But unless you're down by one run in the seventh inning, I mean, if it's a tie game in the second inning and you've got first and third one out, you know, let the pitcher swing the bat, see what happens. But he's not going to get a bunt in by, by, 
I'm sorry, he's not going to get a run in by dropping a bunt down the third baseline. It's just such bad baseball, and they all do it. But as I was saying now, um, we've, we know a lot more about run expectations and you know, producing runs, and uh, so it's going to be a little bit different now because there are some managers that will play it against the book, I hope, in the playoffs. And you're right, though. It's, every run now has more value than it had five, six years ago. And different situations call for different calls. I mean, not every situation is the same. Are you playing for a single run, or are you playing, uh, say, in a late-inning situation where you only need one run? Then there's different rules in place as opposed to a second-inning situation where you, know, you, you would not bunt a run, man on first, nobody out. You're not bunting uh, the, the runner over uh, because... You, you're, you're setting yourself up to not score just a single run, but you might possibly score two, three runs that inning, right. as opposed to the late inning situations where a run would win it, then the bunt is usually in order. Well, um, yes and no. Again, in that situation in Miami, the bunt's not in order because your best hitter now isn't going to get a chance to swing the bat. If I'm Miami in that situation, I want, even if Solano strikes out, and Solano's a good guy with the bat, he can hit the ball behind the runner, I and mean, he can hit the ball to right field. Um, and then if he does, it, it's a little bit different, but you don't want to be in a position. I'd rather have my best hitter up with a man on first and one out um, than not have him have a chance to swing the bat at all. Because Mike Stanton can, I keep calling him Mike, Giancarlo Stanton can hit the ball in the gap, he can hit a double, obviously he can hit it out of the park, but he's He's got to have a chance to swing the bat in that situation, and his own manager made sure that he didn't. So, yeah, every situation is different. Everyone calls for uh, a different approach. But the thing is, though, I'm not certain that the managers don't do things not to get criticized as opposed to doing things that are going to help them win the game. You know, I believe that in that situation, the Marlins bunted because they – that's what you do, you, you bunt, and I don't agree, but you know, if you don't bunt in that situation and Solano hits into a double play, oh, well, maybe there will be criticism. Well, that's, you know, if you can't, what's the word, put on your big boy pants? I mean, you just have to, every situation is different, but, you know, some managers just do, they take the safe route, and I, I, I don't like it. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with Eric Strasser, a.k.a. Palm Tree. His website, palmtreehandicapping.com. He'll have a play for us on tonight's program. Stay tuned for that. We talked about the Garrett Richards injury for the L.A. Angels. How about Manny Machado going down for the Baltimore Orioles? Reports are now that he'll have right knee surgery within the week and will miss the rest of the season. Luckily for the Orioles, they've opened up a commanding lead in the American League East. They're eight clear of the Yankees, nine clear of the Blue Jays, 11 clear of the Rays. They're home and dry in the AL East. Yeah, I think so. And that's a really big injury for the Orioles because not only is he a magician with the glove, but he was their second hitter and he really was swinging the bat well when he went down. So, um, you know, the Orioles have had a wonderful season. Chris Davis is hitting under 200. You know, Manny Machado missed the beginning of the season and now the end of the season. Um, Zach Britton has given up uh, at least uh, three or four ninth-inning leads. Um, it's, they've gotten it from places where you wouldn't expect they would have gotten it from. Matt Wieters has been down, and Caleb Joseph has done. I mean, he throws out 50% of base runners and has hit eight home runs and. In less than half a season. He, the Orioles have really done it. Buck Showalter is the best at building a 25-man team and getting contributions from everybody on the team. He's gotten that this year because nobody on the Orioles is having – well, Nelson Cruz is leading the league in home runs, so I shouldn't say that. But, you know, they're not having career years, and uh, – they're running away from a division that um, few people thought they would win. And I'll tell you, you go back and look at some of these lines. I re- came in here over the All-Star break, and this was one of my plays, was the Orioles were plus 115 to win a division with a four-game lead. And it didn't make any sense then. It makes even less sense now. And I know that they had a tough schedule where they had to go out west for a lot of games and then play Oakland and Seattle at home. But, you know, they're a very, very good baseball team, and they're going to play – 
most likely the team that uh, wins the Central between the Royals and the Tigers in the playoffs. And you'd have to think the Orioles have a very good shot to advance to the ALCS. Boy, won't that be brutal for the three American League West representatives (laughs) uh, to be involved in a play-in game and then to face your division foe in the ALDS. That's, uh, That's tough to stomach. Well, it's possible that it doesn't work out that way because the Angels now, I think, are 76 and 51. They were 76 and 50 going mm-hmm. into tonight. And the Orioles are what? 19? 70, 73 and 53. So Okay, so 20 games over 500. So the Orioles are only three games or two and a half games mm-hmm. behind for, in the race for best record. And the Orioles' schedule, right? They went through a gauntlet uh, the last month, but now. They play a lot of the AL East teams. They got a lot of games left with the Yankees, the Rays, and uh, the Red Sox. Um, and you know these other teams. The problem for Seattle in making the playoffs is they have so many games left with the Angels and the A's. The problem for the Angels and the A's in holding on to best record is they have a lot of games with the Mariners and you know the other one. So don't count the Orioles out of best record. They have a, certainly have a chance. And in this case, though. It happens in the NBA just about every year where teams want to play somebody or don't want to play somebody. I mean, if you're the Orioles, you don't want to finish for, uh, first. You don't want home field advantage throughout because you're going to end up playing a team that's better. And I believe that both the Angels and the Mariners and the A's, all three of them, are better than the Royals and the Tigers. So, you know, you can make the argument. I understand the argument that the Royals are streaking and they're great and all that other stuff. I understand that. But in my opinion, those are the three best, uh, you know, teams in that situation. So for the Orioles, you want to sit right where you are maybe and um, it would be a little bit better to not to finish first. He's Eric Strasser. I'm John Kelly. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. EOG stands for Ion Gaming. EOG.com, a website dedicated to the hearts and minds of sports bettors everywhere. This time last week, we were talking about head moderator leaving town. Uh, in another week and a half or so, we'll have some special announcements involving Ion Gaming, some interesting developments, and uh, we're going to re boot, reload, uh, uh, restaff the uh, EOG community. Uh, Better feel, a cleaner feel, I think, come Monday, September 1st. Check it out. Check out the main forum at EOG.com. Plans in the works as I speak. Eric Strasser, have teams quit in Major League Baseball? Have you seen a team or two that uh, has called it a season? We talked earlier about the Boston Red Sox. Anybody else other than the Red Sox? calling it a year uh again i have to credit the person who said it first and on his show today i think uh dave Coken said it and i think he's absolutely right the reds have quit the reds are absolutely a dead team right now um they're showing they were getting no hit tonight into the eighth inning and billy hamilton with a two-out single which was nothing more than a bloop otherwise they would have been no hit by mike minor who certainly hasn't been um lighting the world on fire I think the Reds, they've had numerous years of playing down to the final game. Um, But even Johnny Cueto, uh, two nights ago against the Cardinals, he just looked like he would rather be just about anywhere else. Uh, I think the Reds have quit. I think that... Does the market know they've quit? Well, you know, the, the Braves have... I saw Tehran about $1.90 the other day. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's uh, David Holmberg's, you know, he, he, was, uh, he was a joke when he was with the Diamondbacks, and he hasn't gotten any better. So we may have seen the last of him, which is a shame uh, from a betting perspective. <laughs> but uh, $1.90 on the road, too, Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the market's catching up pretty quickly to the Reds. You know, the opposite of that, I'll get to your question in a second, but I just want to mention it. Let's give a little bit of credit to the Philadelphia Phillies. They, this week, tonight, they beat Adam Wainwright at home as a significant underdog. Something wrong with Wainwright, correct? (sighs) Yeah, well, I didn't see any of the game tonight, so I don't want to, I don't know. I just don't know. I didn't get to see any of the game. But the point is, the Phillies... Earlier this week, took on the Mariners in a three-game series at uh, Citizens Bank Park, and they won two out of three. They beat James Paxton, who and they shouldn't have. It was uh, three unearned runs that beat them, and the Mariners screwed up a squeeze play in a getaway game where their minds were 
anywhere but on the game. Uh, and Jerome Williams, who has pitched the best bowl of his career against the Mariners, did it again and uh, beat a pretty good beatdown on the Mariners the Phillies put on Monday night. So let's give them a little bit of credit. That's a team that clearly hasn't quit because they're beating good teams at home, which is uh, a very good sign for them. And the Phillies have put together a really nice bullpen now. I mean, they have a lot of young kids. Um, this kid, uh, Giles and DeFreitas, and they've really got some good young arms out there. Um, I don't like the, where the Phillies are because they've got so many bad contracts and guys with can't play anymore with a lot of years to go. But uh, they, there are some guys there that are going to be uh, going to be fun for the Philly fans to watch. Um, the Twins haven't quit. They put twenty on the Tigers tonight. They swept. Uh, the White Sox a week and a half ago in Chicago, um, they're playing decent ball. And Phil Hughes did something which pretty much nobody else has done all season uh, the other day, and he outpitched Corey Kluber, who has been ridiculously good. So you can't say that. The Astros haven't quit. They're still playing good baseball. And uh, the Cubs haven't quit. And they have a guy going tomorrow, Kyle Hendricks, who has just ignited passion for uh, among Cubs fans because – He's done things that nobody expected from him. So there's a lot of teams that you can say haven't quit. I mean, I don't think the Rockies have quit. They're still kind of playing. They just don't have any pitching. They have no pitching and they have no bullpen. Everybody's been hurt. Tulo and Cargo aren't there. I mean, they're down to nothing. Um, so it's hard to say that they've quit. But when, you know, I got a break with the Rockies tonight. I bet the team total over. And it was four, and they were sitting on four in the fifth inning. It went. Uh, seven four to the ninth inning, John, and then the Marlins put up uh, what did I think it was six runs to make it thirteen four. So instead of dealing with Steve Ciszek, we got to see Sam Dyson, who throws <laughs> ninety eight, but he's not Ciszek. And um, you know, two batters in, the leadoff triple, and then a line drive single, and my team total overcame in, and I was very appreciative of those runs in the top of the inning because of what it meant for the bottom of the inning. So that was a little bit of a of a good break. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Pirates haven't played good ball, but they haven't quit, and uh, the Padres haven't quit. The Diamondbacks, a lot of young guys are playing, and I think the Diamondbacks are a team that if they haven't quit, they're about to quit. I just I don't see a whole lot there. So, uh, you know, the Red Sox, I don't think there's too many of the high-priced veterans that are interested in playing uh too much. You know, David Ortiz, um, I heard, didn't show up for the team picture yesterday. And that's a sign that his mind is not on the team. Something's wrong there. So, Yeah, and Cespedes left the game early yesterday, I believe, the family matter. Right, yeah, but that could be any. I mean, if his kid is sick or mm-hmm. something happened, I, I, I think you got to give him the benefit of the doubt unless you know exactly what it was. I mean, there are certainly some excuses that wouldn't be acceptable, but in that situation, until you know what it is, I think you've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, you know, the Indians haven't quit, but, you know, there are, as we said, there are a couple of teams led by the Reds and the Red Sox that you certainly don't want to have your money on because I don't think you can ever count on getting their best efforts. We'll step aside and take the final time out of the program. When we return, we'll ask Eric about Saturday's baseball card. Typically, uh, we run down the entire 15-game card at Major League Baseball. Tonight, a bit of a diversion as Eric is talking about the league at large. His website, palmtreehandicapping.com. When we return, we'll get his best play on the other side of the break. There's no such thing as a sure thing, unless you're talking about Ion Gaming. Ion Gaming is a website dedicated to the hearts and minds of sports bettors everywhere. If you're looking for smart, sophisticated sports handicapping information and insight, go to EOG.com. If you're looking for the latest news on the ever-changing landscape of Nevada's race and sportsbook industry, go to EOG. If you're looking for the most recent developments involving the worldwide sports betting scene with an emphasis on the leading sports books in San Jose, Costa Rica, go to EOG.com. And finally, if you're looking to join an online community of sports gamblers where registration is free and the information is priceless, go to EOG.com. You get the idea. Why gamble on other sports betting websites when I on gaming is a sure thing? And I love a sure thing. Talking baseball. 
And we're back. The EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with you on a Friday night alongside Eric Strasser. We're talking Major League Baseball for tomorrow. A selection coming up in a moment. Uh, Eric, you had a note about the interleague game tomorrow at Wrigley Field. Good pitching matchup. Cubs and O's, Hendricks and Norris. O's are favored on the road, minus $1.13. And when we started to talk earlier, we were talking about Matt Shoemaker. He's got 12 wins, and the major league lead is 15. How about Bud Norris with 11 wins? Bud Norris was a throw-in. I mean, he's been a bottom of a rotation guy. He's got 11 wins, 127 innings pitched, only 116 hits allowed, 96-38 um, KBB ratio. And on the other side of it, Kyle Hendricks for the Cubs has just been terrific. They've Cubs have won six of his last seven starts. He's only pitched 42 innings since coming up from the minors. 30 hits allowed, uh, 50% ground ball rate. His ERA at home is under half a run. Uh, all of this really makes for a very strong under tomorrow. Uh, we don't know where it is because it's Wrigley Field and they're going to put up a number. But the one thing that uh, kind of throws um, water on the flames of the candle is the over the umpire behind home plate, Chris Siegel. He's not only 16 and six to the over this year, but he is a very very difficult guy for pitchers to throw to. I mean, he's not as consistent as his, he should be, and his strike zone is really very small. It's difficult, so it makes it a very difficult uh, to play the under, and especially without knowing the wins and anything. But I think the really good play tomorrow is to look at the under, and if it's 7.5 uh, without the wind blowing out, I think uh, the under is probably a pretty good play. I missed Our, a bet this afternoon at Wrigley Cubs. Orioles, Arietta Gausman, that's one of my favorite angles. I love when a pitcher goes back to face his former team. Mm. Jake Arietta uh, was with Baltimore and Buck Showalter, in fact. Uh, yep. you know, and uh, uh, I'm sure Ari was, Arietta was glad uh, uh, to beat his former team. Th- that happens. You, know, you get about 30, 35 starts in a Major League Baseball season. Anytime a pitcher for me, Eric, gets pumped up for a specific start, I always take a good, hard <laughs> look at the game. Well, and don't I feel like a fool because I was on the Orioles today. <laughs> I got them at plus money. The Cubs played a game and a half yesterday. Great travel angle with the Orioles today, although it obviously didn't work out, is they played a series in Chicago with the White Sox. So now they went across the Wrigley and played against the Cubs. They didn't even have to leave their hotel rooms. So uh, they were fat and happy and uh, didn't work out, but Arietta was great. He really did uh he really did give it to the uh, to the O's. There was a travel angle in the Washington San Francisco game today. The Giants did not arrive in our nation's capital until six o'clock in the morning. Yet they clobber the Nationals ten <laughs> three. You could see it coming. The Nash- I mean, you cannot play against a team on a ten game winning streak. But I don't think there was anybody who handicaps baseball every day that was surprised uh, to see the Giants go in there and beat up the Nats. They were just they were due. And you know, Doug Fister, one of his rare bad starts. Think about the dichotomy. Look at the Tigers struggling for pitching. They bring up Robbie Ray, and he gets absolutely destroyed tonight. Doug Fister was traded for Robbie Ray by Dave Dombrowski, or or Doug Fister, yeah, um, last winter, and gosh, what was he thinking? I mean, Fister has just been terrific. You've got a note on the Diamondbacks-Padres game from Chase Field tomorrow. Interesting game. Vidal Nuno has not pitched badly for the Diamondbacks. He's actually been pretty good. 13 runs allowed, 12 earned in 44 innings as a Diamondback, 38 to 10 strikeout to walk ratio. The Diamondbacks have lost every start that Nuno has made since the trade. He's o- they are 0 and 8 in games that he started. Um, the Diamondbacks, to me, against especially you don't know what you're going to see with Cashner coming back off the DL, but I mean the Diamondbacks just go out of their way to lose games with Nuno on the mound, so it's something I'm going to avoid. One minute remaining. Eric Strasser, our feature guest tonight. PalmTreeHandicapping.com, his website. Give us your best bet for Saturday. Well, I'm going to play the Pirates and the Brewers under eight. Um, Edison Volquez, people hear Edison Volquez and they get squeamish, but Ray Searage has done a great job. He turned around Francisco Lariano, now he's turned around Edison Volquez. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. 146 innings, 132 hits allowed. Only 53 walks and 146 innings, which people don't expect about Anderson Volquez. His fastball velocity, which was about 95 last year, is now up over 97 on a you know on a year-to-year basis. So um, Volquez is in great form. Willie Peralta, 15 wins for Willie Peralta. Who would even know that? 
Six innings of scoreless baseball last time out in L.A. against the Dodgers. He's got a 54% ground ball rate. Uh, it's going to be a great pitching matchup. I can't wait to watch it. Brewers and Pirates under the total of eight. Peralta and Balquez tomorrow at Miller Park. First pitch at 410 Pacific time. That'll wrap up our fast-moving program. For Eric Strasser, I'm John Kelly. Thanks for listening to the EOG Sports Hour. Our conversation continues at EOG.com.